and to truth. Uh, the, more, the, more, the more structural, monotonous, grammatical side of language uh, is associated with reason rather than with passion. And it's therefore quite, quite contrary to Augustine's, uh, that's where the corruption lies. The second striking feature that many philosophy, philosophies of voice seem to share is that in almost every case in which the outer acoustic resonance of the speaking or singing voice occurs, it seems to be accompanied by a reference or an attempt to describe a very different experience of voice. It's the experience of an inner voice that enters the scene. And whilst lacking the external nature or acoustic resonance of the embodied musical voice, there's no you know, sound waves in the air here. And yet, nevertheless, this voice is clearly audible. Moreover, this voice is almost always distinguishable from the constant murmur of the author's own thought process. So you can't just say it's the, it's the interior monologue. The inner voice enters the scene as the voice of an other. And what characterizes this voice is that it tends to have an undeniable authority, which is impossible to ignore and is associated with uh, clear moral guidance. An example of this uh, thematization of an inner voice is to be found in the famous passage in Plato's Apology in which uh, Socrates describes or invokes a personal demon, um, which he says manifests itself in his mind in the form of a strange voice-like noise. He says, perhaps it may seem strange that I go about and interfere in other people's aff affairs to give this advice in private, but I do not venture to come before your assembly and advise the state. The reason for this is that something divine and spiritual comes to me. I've had it from my childhood. It's a sort of voice that comes to me, and when it comes, it always holds me back from what I'm thinking of doing. It never urges me forward. This is what opposes my engagement in politics. Strangely, what appears to define the authority of this inner voice is not what it says. It's almost as if whatever it were to say, uh, Socrates would be driven to obey. But the very fact, it's the very fact that it is perceived. Which brings me to the question of the nature of this kind of auditory experience. Since what characterizes the perception of this voice is not what it says, but its sheer sound, its sheer recognition as voice. And yet, short, curiously, it's a sound that lacks acoustic resonance. So how to relate this silent, yet nevertheless audible, inner voice to the outer, acoustically resonant voice? What is the nature of the sound of the inner voice, and how does it compare with the physical resonance or musicality of spoken language? Is there a connection at all? And if so, how or where is one to place the ethical or moral call that is associated with this voice? Could the, could the seeming mora morality of the call of the inner voice actually have something to do with its silent resonance? Or with the very sa different sounding nature of the outer voice? In other words, could it be that there's something sensual and rhythmical about human consciousness or indeed conscience itself? And if so, could this sensuality of conscience, which here takes the form of an inner voice, could it be connected to the idea that there is a silent dimension that is in fact intrinsic to the nature of the audible, acoustic, physically resonant, noise-like sounding human voice? In a nutshell, it would seem that the quest for a philosophy of voice leads to the need to investigate the sounding nature of the inner voice on the one hand and a dimension of silence intrinsic to the outer resonant voice on the other. Could the two dimensions be intertwined in a kind of chiasmic structure? This question can be clarified with recourse to a third possible route to discovering the place of voice in philosophy. It's a phenomenology of voice. Filtering out of all one's habitual assumptions, theoretical prejudices, and acquired knowledge pertaining to voices, 
And simply attempting to concentrate on the sound or the colour of a voice can be fruitful as a philosophic method, leading to some quite surprising discoveries. For a start, the difficulty uh, involved in separating voice from language, uh, the moment uh, is, quite, is quite striking. You know, the, mo the moment I begin to listen to what a, a voice is saying, I tend to lose focus of the sounding materiality of the medium. And the other way around, when I focus on the fleshy, melodious noise uh, of the words as they are formed in the, in, in the speaker's mouth and resonate through her body, I tend to lose track of their meaning. A phenomenological approach also quickly brings into relief the dramatic quality of a voice as address, as appeal. As soon as a, an acoustic sound is recognised as a voice, it immediately le leaves the realm of mere sonorous noise and becomes more than just a bodily vibration. I instantly become aware that someone is possibly trying to say something, possibly to me and possibly requesting my response. Indeed, it would need to be, or it would seem to be, in, a very, in, in, in the very sounding nature of voice that in speaking or even just emitting noise, it evokes, perhaps even invokes, in other words, implies, appeals to, and brings about an audience, even if the audience is the speaker himself or someone not physically present. In this sense, an ethical quality is inscribed within the very phenomenality of the voice insofar as it is always already effective, perceived as a call appealing for a response. Moreover, as the mind and senses focus more attentively on the sounding resonance of the voices that surround us, a host of paradoxes gradually begin to emerge, which seem to have to do with the particular threshold character there was talk a lot about this yesterday, the threshold character of this mysterious and ephemeral of phenomena. For a voice is both individual and communal. On the one hand, every voice seems to be unique. No two voices are quite the same. So in this sense, every voice is the signature of an individual. And yet, on the other hand, no voice ever resonates alone, but always emerges in a sea of other voices, inter interwoven mimetically. And so every voice, each particular grain, is not only constituted through interaction with other voices, but as a result of this process, it also contains uncanny traces of the company of others. In a voice, that which is most personal cannot be extricated from that which is shared. Again, though now on a slightly different level, we can hear something of an ethical contour. So, both individual and communal, both linguistic and non-linguistic. As a medium of voice, the human voice is distinct from language. It has its origin in a time before language, for instance, in the noise of pre-linguistic babble. It functions as an index for, what, for that which goes beyond or cannot be expressed in language for instance, in the display of inconceptualizable emotion. And yet, in another sense, it is dependent on language insofar as distinct from noise and colored by language, like the particular grain of a French or Spanish voice. And it points to the taking place of language as in its calling nature, it signifies a wanting to say. linguistic and non-linguistic, temporal and transcendent. On the one hand, the voice is a physical production of the concrete human body. As such, it is bound to the, to the concrete, imminent materiality, existing in a particular space and time. As such, it is a, a deictic marker. Yet on the other hand, insofar as it and the body from which it emanates is not only perceived by the other's physical ear, but also by his or her acoustic imagination, and thereby connected to a logic of desire, attraction or aversion, the voice resonates beyond its physical transience. As a phantasmagoric voice, it transcends the body, becoming in a certain sense atemporal. And finally, sounding resonance and silent potential. On the surface of perception, a voice is of course sounding resonance, a physical vibration perceivable by a biological ear.
But voice is not just the random disturbance of sound waves or the consequence of spontaneous or involuntary arbitrary friction, not simply parasitical to communication, not just noise. To formulate a thesis, what distinguishes voice from noise is its intrinsic relation to the possibility of silence. For insofar as silence can be considered as a mode of vocal expression, voice cannot be defined in clear opposition to silence, nor vice versa. It follows from this that the philosophy of voice is not exhausted in a philosophy of human performance qua activity, but also must take into account and articulate itself as a philosophy of human potentiality. So I've named and outlined three different pathways towards uncovering the place of voice in philosophy. Of course, in a given philosophy, these three pathways uh, you know, may intertwine or, or, or somehow interconnect like a complex labyrinth. What a particular philosophy, philosopher has said or written about voice may or, mo may or may not reveal something about the phenomenology of voice, may or may not reflect upon its own tonality. To finish, I'd like to explore the latter, this relationship between voice as sound and voice as silence in the move towards an, what I call a negative philosophy of voice. Articulating this negative philosophy involves dwelling precisely at the moment on, 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 or at the, on the, at the passage from noise to voice, with noise conceived here as perhaps always already more than just random friction, insofar as uh, perceived as such, it relates, albeit as disturbance, to a realm of potentiality in, 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 or intentional, or potentially, in, potentially intentional meaning. And voice, on the other hand, as never quite reducible to linguistic uh, signaling. Most recent theories of voice tend to focus on the acoustic, embodied, actualized, speaking, uttering sound of voice. And the most fascinating at the moment that, that I'm kind of still intrigued by is a book by uh, Michael Levin, some of you might know, it's called uh, Before the Voice of Reason. It's a focus on the, on the sounding nature of voice and its relation to to ecology, it's quite, it's quite um, thought-provoking. But my question is, do we not experience on a daily basis the reality and, and, and power of voices that are withheld, voices that refrain from actually speaking, silent voices? I expect that a voice that we're only ever in a mode of active, uh, uh, actual speaking, a voice that knew, knew no silence could not be a real voice, nor even identified as a hallucination. So my quest is thus for a theory of voice that does not reduce voice to mere sound, or stated differently, I'm looking for a concept of sound that allows it to be stretched beyond the actual moment of its resonance. A philosophy of voice, if you like, that resonates or echoes into and beyond silence. In attempting to grasp this negative philosophy of voice, Agamben, amongst others, has had, much, has had much to offer. His enigmatic book, Language and Death, describes a philosophy of voice that is built or not built on the idea that the human voice in question speaks continuously and from the start. The fact that humans are born without being able to speak is essential here. It means that our first experience of voice, including hearing our mothers or, or voice or the, the voices of people around, is an experience of voice that says nothing. And yet neither is it a meaningless voice. It's a, this voice is negative in the sense that unlike the voice of animals who are always already in harmony with their own language, they don't generally have to learn to speak, though there are exceptions, it is no longer mere noise, but not yet meaning. This experience of voice at the threshold to meaning is of fundamental importance for Agamben's concept of potentiality, the source of which he considers to reside in human infancy. This experience of potentiality is not only to be interpreted as an experience of the possibility of speaking, 
more profoundly at stake here is the experience of a fundamentally human inability. For a gambon, even when voice becomes articulated language, there remains on a deep level a trace of this pure infant vocality which cannot speak. He pursues this idea of pure vocality throughout the history of Western philosophy and poetry and discovers a link between it and the idea of nothingness and the relationship of humans to death. Both Hegel and Heidegger recognize a close connection between the relationship of humans to language and their consciousness of mortality. For Hegel, human articulation begins in the suspension of tran or transcendence of, hum of animal voice. Man begins to speak at the point where the animal cries out at the moment of death, a vocal utterance on the brink to, ar uh, to articulation. The animal's death is thus conceived by Heidegger as a threshold of sorts to human language. For Heidegger, on the other hand, Dasein is always already thrown into being without a voice. But this negativity, Dasein's thrownness, leads to an opening which, conceived as an acoustic of the soul, brings about the Stimmung in which the call of consciousness as a silent voice is heard, thus enabling Dasein to articulate its relationship to nothingness. And at this point, inner and outer voice appear to intertwine. The sound of the inner voice conditions, as it were, the possibility of the outer voice, which in the face of death remains silent. And whoever knows this silence will recognize more than mere noise in the sounding nature of the other's voice, one's counterpart. In this experience of a call without content lies an ethical potential which is rooted in the phenomenal voice, understood here as the interdependence of inner and outer vocality. A consequence of this recognition is that our attention must not be directly so, or directed solely to the, to the outer sounding voice, for the voice that is withheld is in many ways just as telling. And only when voice remains silent can silence begin to speak. But where does this voice or this philosophy of voice leave us or take us when we turn back to the realm of theatre and performance? One perhaps most obvious thing to note is that in its implicit theatricality, the phenomenon of voice shares much with that which constitutes theatre and performance. This is apparent in its ephemeral temporality, implicit indexicality, eigneshaftigkeit, etc., the alive here and now, both of, of voice and of that which makes a theatrical event, as well as in its always already beingness for another beingness for an audience and the implicit request of a response. But what a meditation upon the sounding nature of voice also, and perhaps essentially, reveals is that, almost curiously, its experience is not exhausted in its sounding materiality. Together, the complex relationship between inner and outer levels of voice on the one hand, and the various dimensions of silence within voice on the other, when transferred to or confronted with the realm of theatre and performance, together they gesture towards the dimensions in which a theatrical event is never quite reducible to the simple materiality of what goes on in it or what actually occurs in the space. Intriguingly, almost ironically, the very performative turn that has led critics and philosophers to concern themselves with... Uh, the specific materiality, embodiment, and temporal liveness of what is carried out within and thereby constitutes theatre also points, in a certain sense, to the transcendence of these elements. And thus it would seem that this is what the prism of voice certainly appears to reveal, um, that an intense preoccupation with that which is present necessarily leads to an increased attentiveness towards that which is not yet fully there, but might be, could be on the brink. Stated bluntly and simply, a conscious focus on sound sharpens the listener's ears to the surrounding pregnant silence. Yet the transcendence of performance that I'm gesturing towards here must not be misunderstood 
as transcendence in an absolute sense, not something that necessarily takes us beyond the material or out of the body, for it clearly takes place within immanence. It's a transcendence, if you like, that relies centrally on the human senses insofar as these are capable, essentially, of sensing beyond themselves and the moment towards the silent yet potential or resonant potential within. Thus, what the voice in relation to theatre reveals is not simply on a banal level that theatre and performance is never just uh, visual but always sonorous and synesthetic, but what, happens on, but what happens on stage is constituted as much by that which occurs on the imminent level of concrete phenomenality, creaking, floorboards, airless space, moving, calling bodies, all combining to underline an urgency of the present moment, as by that which does not occur, what could have, what might have, but doesn't quite. Theatre is made, one could say, for the ears as much as for the eyes, and by action and occurrence, as much as by inaction and non-occurrence. The philosophy of voice reveals this, but also more, that it is never just eyes on the one hand and ears on the other, not action on the one hand and refrainment or potentiality on the other. Although these different dimensions can be methodically differentiated uh, on a theoretical, perhaps also theatrical level, what the enigma of voice in fact suggests is that a real challenge of theory and theatre is precisely to understand, to grasp and to bring to expression the intrinsic chiasmic interrelation of these various dimensions. Eyes as ears, ears as eyes, and action in and as inaction on the level of the phenomenon. Vielen Dank.